This is the sixth video in the series on draw FBP, and in this one I'll be concentrating on uh, interactive applications at a fairly high level, and also talking a little bit about Java FBP WebSockets, which is a project on GitHub among my repositories. We're going to be talking about simple interactive applications. We'll start off with a a block which is uh, interact with human and then we'll have um, an action up here um, do some processing just say process line them up and um, return a response so we'll just say respond line that up and hook everything up. I've put a little human here to uh, just indicate symbolically that this block interacts with human users. This doesn't actually generate any code. This symbol is one of the few in DrawFBP that uh, are just used for uh, decoration. Uh, they're legend, file, person, and report and to some extent uh, enclosure, but that has a number of other useful functions. If you remember your Flubis programming scheduling rules, you'll remember that um, only processes with no non-IIP input ports start by themselves. So all of these guys have input ports, so then the question becomes, how does the loop ever get started? What we usually do in this situation is add a do-nothing block, which we usually call a kicker. And I'm just doing this to show you what the, a loop diagram would, should really look like. But because we won't be needing this in later stages of the evolution of this diagram, I'm just going to remove it to simplify the diagram. Um, actions, delete, delete, yes. I have put uh, double lines around this block to indicate that it's a subnet. But at this level of design, I'm just trying to show that it will be expanded later. This diagram, therefore, could be called the minimal interactive application. The uh, human inputs data, it goes through the loop and comes back and is returned to the human. And basically it will be one at a time. During the think time for the human, this process will be waiting, but these other ones can actually do some processing. Of course, the amount of time where the human is thinking is quite long compared with any machine actions, even if I.O. is involved. So the first thing I'm going to do with this diagram is to take this block and split it into two pieces, one which will be handling human input to the machine, and the other one will be handling output from the machine to the human. Our diagram now looks like this. This is a good general design for an interactive system. And in fact, as you can see, these two blocks here could service actually multiple users. Provided, of course, that all the data for a given user comes out from this uh, process grouped together. You don't want it interspersed with data from other users. Alternatively, the uh, user could decide to send more requests into the network before having received a response from an earlier request. Given the power that people have on their desks or on portable devices, it makes sense to split this diagram across two machines, the client and the server. The diagram now looks like this. We're going to be using WebSockets to communicate between these two in the two different directions. And I've used the legend function to show that uh, we're using WebSockets. And uh, actually, in the demonstration at the end of the video, I'll be using Java FBP WebSockets, which is a separate project on GitHub 
It is written using Java WebSocket by Tutol Nate, also known as Nate Riley, and it's entirely written in Java. It's available on GitHub at this location or can be downloaded from Maven. Now, I'd like to point out that you can add additional paths to this diagram. You can introduce cross connections. For example, if receive discovers something wrong with this input message, it can simply send a warning message across to respond. It'll get sent back. Now, you'll notice that the default port names are out. So you can't have two port names both called out. So we'll have to change this one to call it error. Upstream port name, change it to error. So that's now a more legal diagram. Or this process may decide that the logic needs to cycle through the block on the right hand side um, one or more times. So the um, data stream could go around here and come back here. Um, now we can't have two ports with the same name, so we're going to have to change the port name on this one. So that will be edit upstream port name, call it option or something, OPT. So that's good, that's happy. Another scenario that uh, could be of interest is um, where this uh, process um, gets, part of it gets um, sent out onto a, uh, onto a offline system. And um, in our brokerage application, under some circumstances, offers had to go through to an offline system where they would be batched up and processed. And um, the responses to that would come back around this path. And uh, since they were being batched up, of course, they had to be related back to the originating requests before they could be sent out back along here to the user. So somewhere in here, of course, there had to be a table of pending offers, which would then get correlated and the combined results would then be sent back to the user. In the brokerage package that I worked on, we did this using Corba, and it turned out to be a good match with flow-based programming. So I would split the block initially into send to offline and response from offline, which of course have to be matched up before the result can pass on down here. Other techniques that can be used to uh, extend the diagram are uh, load balancing, described briefly at the end of this video, and caching. Now, just to, for ease of reading for the next part, I'm going to straighten this semi-loop out into a straight line. To get it onto the chart, I had to fold it like this, but now everything's running from left to right, unidirectional. And you'll notice the client is here and here. And the WebSockets direction is the same in both cases. As I've talked about elsewhere, in classical flow-based programming, the um, data travels across the network in chunks that we call information packets that have a well-defined ownership. Uh, they must be owned either by a process or be on a connection. And they have a well-defined lifetime from the time they are created to the time they are destroyed. Now, given that communication between processes in classical flow-based programming is by way of streams of data chunks, a key part of the design process is to decide the um, formats and sequence of the data chunks going across a connection. And for this, we're using the um, FPP concept of substreams. Substreams can be nested, and they're delimited by specialized IPs called brackets. Not surprisingly, they're open brackets and closed brackets. I can never really decide in which order to draw, draw the items in a substream, but 
Anyway, the intent is probably clearer in this one. The intent is that you have an open bracket followed by the screen request entity, um, which in our case is an IP containing a reference to the socket, and then the data IPs and then the close bracket. Each substream represents an interaction with the user, and multiple substreams can be chasing each other through the network. I've tried to show this symbolically uh, using a sort of a shorthand. SRE stands for Screen Request Entity, which is an older term based on the software we were using some years ago and described in my book. Now I'd like to demonstrate the uh, Java FBP WebSockets project on my GitHub repository. Two components, which are basically receive and respond. And then we have one example network, test WebSockets, which is a normal Java FBP network. You'll notice it has a load balance process in here and process and respond are replicated. Load balance has recently been upgraded so that all of the items within a single substream go to the same output port. We also have two identical HTML5 clients which send requests to the server and handle the responses. The two uh, chat HTML5 scripts are provided to allow concurrent testing. There is a send function which sends out a bracket that we've talked about before, one or more data items, which I prefixed with a client number, and a close bracket. The on message tests whether the received data is an open or a close bracket, and if it's neither, it tacks a li tag onto the data and appends it to the unordered list, which is down here, uh, which has the tag of container. If on message detects an incoming open bracket, it clears all the preceding allies from the UL container. So if I click on this, the web browser, and that's what the user will see. To run this example on Eclipse, you need uh, the Java WebSocket jar file available from Maven and the Java FBP latest jar file, which is also on Maven. If you want to rebuild this project, you'll also need tools.jar from the Java JDK, but that's not needed to actually run the job. I have included a very simple-minded little process block, which is straight Java FPP. Uh, you can see that it handles two uh, commands, nameList and complist. NameList is very simple. It uh, sends out a left bracket. P1, which is actually the SRE from our diagrams containing the uh, socket reference. And then it creates three data packets and a close. Complist is more complex and it displays the contents, all the files in a JAR file, where you specify the actual file address of the JAR file in the data field in the uh, uh, HTML. Now we go to the uh, sample network, go to debug as Java application, and you'll see WebSocket server starting. Now we go down to one of these chat HTML files, right click, open with web browser, and we're going to run complist, which displays the content contents of a JAR file. And that code is in the little sample component, semproc. So enter complist and the name of the JAR file. Hit send. And there's your data from the JAR file. And in here, in this panel, you'll see the trace from the server. If I go to the top, hit stop WS, you'll see um, from the trace that the run is complete and you get the time, the uh, usual Java FBP counts. Here are some useful URLs. I'm just going to leave them up here for a few seconds. So that's it. Thanks for watching.